Okay, so the last uh, group that we're gonna talk about in our prehistoric Aegean module is the Helladic group, right? And remember, Helladic refers to uh, any prehistoric Aegean culture that is on the Greek mainland, what is now Greece. This is pre-Greece, remember, but what is now Greece, um, anything that was on the Greek mainland at this time is called Helladic. All right, so here's another map, because you know I like maps. Um, one of the main cultures that we're mostly going to focus on uh, in this part of the lectures is uh, the Mycenaeans. So they're from Mycenae, as you might suspect. <laughs> and you can see that it is there on the southern part of the Greek mainland. Okay, so I have Athens on here for a reference, and then you can see on Crete, Gnosis is down below, you can see where Thera is, and then up at the top of the map you can see Troy. So remember that Agamemnon, who was a king of Mycenae, led the forces, the Greek forces, against Troy in the Trojan War. So you can see how far up they were traveling. All right, so the origins of the Mycenaean, I have trouble saying that word, so I know that I'm saying it kind of slow, but Forgive me, I'm from the Ozarks, I'm doing my best. <laughs> um, the origins of the Mycenaean culture are still kind of debated a little bit. The only thing that is known for sure is the presence of the forerunners of the Greeks on the Greek mainland about that time. Um, it, it's, it kind of correlates with what the time range of what was happening on Crete. So it's about the time that the old palaces were built on Crete. Um, we know that there was a big presence on the mainland um, that uh, came to be known as the Mycenaeans. Minoan civilization definitely influenced these people, and some actually believe that the mainland Greeks, the Helladic Greeks at this time, were kind of dependent on the Minoans economically because they were the seafaring people, they were very good at traveling and fishing and had resources and knew how to do all this fabulous pottery and metalwork and frescoes. So the thought is that there was definitely a trade relationship between these two entities and that there was some um, pretty heavy influence coming from the Minoans to the Helladic cultures. Uh, by 1500 BC, a distinctive Mycenaean culture had developed on the mainland. Um, several centuries later, Homer, our friend, the writer, not Homer Simpson, describes the My, um, Mycenae as rich in gold. So it's, it was uh, reportedly a very wealthy culture uh, in its own right as it gets more established and becomes more independent from the Minoans. Okay, come on slides. There we go. All right, Helladic art. Let's look at some of this. Um, this late Helladic civilization has come to be called Mycenae, as I said, and, the, and uh, Mycenae was one of several large citadels on the mainland. What's a citadel? It's a palace, but when we hear citadel, it means that it's also kind of a fortress, all right? It's more fortified than, um, say, the Minoan palaces that we were looking at. Archaeologists have found Mycenaean artifacts at Tiernes, Okrominos, and Pylos, as well as uh, uh, Mycenae, right? Um, but we're, we're going to look at the best preserved ones, which are at Mycenae and Turns. Okay, so uh, the severity of these fortress palaces was um, relieved some by frescoes, kind of like the ones at Gnosis, so we had a lot of colorful painting inside these, inside these uh, structures. And in Agamemnon's Mycenae, at least um, by monumental architecture and sculpture. So, ooh, I skipped ahead. I want to talk about the Lion Gate first. All right, so here's the Lion Gate. Um, this is the outer gateway of the citadel at Mycenae. It is, um, so this pathway going up to it is like 20 feet wide, so it's quite a wide uh, entrance channel. And the slab that the lions are carved into, that's one sla solid slab of rock, and that is nine feet tall. So just to give you an idea of the scale here, 
the doorway is comprised of two massive stones and an even more massive lintel. So just huge blocks of stone being used here. The relief carved slab is triangular. This is not incidental, this is not an accident. This is by design and it serves a, a structural engineering purpose. Um, this is called a relieving triangle, okay, because it, it relieves pressure. Um, so it lightens the weight on the lintel below by diverting weight from the wall on the side out and down through the post. So it's not all just on the lintel, so it might fall on someone's head, which would be bad. Uh, okay, so not only do we have pretty uh, sophisticated ideas going on here in terms of the structural integrity of this gate, but we also have very large scale carvings. The lions have both lost their heads over the years, uh, which is unfortunate, but we do have uh, some skill in the, the detailed rendering of the bodies, and then we see the capital col and column between them. So we have some architectural details there as well. Okay. Uh, Homer, again, our writer friend, knew the citadel of Turns as Turns of the Great Walls. This is what it was called. In the second century uh, CE, so a contemporary era, um, a guy named uh, Pausanias, P-A-U-S-A-N-I-A-S, -A -A Pausanias, he, I think he's a really fascinating figure. So he was sort of, he gets called a historian a lot, but really the thing that he wrote was more like a, um, it was kind of like a guidebook like a where to go in the ancient world, which I think is kind of rad. So uh, he writes this guidebook that's about Greece for the ancient world. So written much later than when um, the people who lived in turns were there. Uh, so he travels all around, he goes down to Egypt, he goes all over and he's writing this guidebook. And um, when he visits this site of Turn, which is in ruins, even for the ancient Greeks, it's in, it's in ruins by the time um, Pausanias gets there to write about it, he was blown away. He said the walls were as spectacular as the pyramids in Egypt. So these are just massive walls that kind of blew his mind. And the Greeks thought it was built by um, the mythic giant race of Cyclops because they thought the stones were too large for normal humans to have physically moved them. So this again is an example of a um, uh, art history remnant or artifact, in this case uh, the ruins of the citadel, influencing the development of mythology. So this idea of cyclopses, these giant, giant people who had one eye, is developed to explain ruins that the ancient Greeks couldn't figure out how people made. So it's kind of interesting. So they made up this mythic race of, of giants that would have constructed this. Um, all right, historians, actually, this is kind of a fun little thing, still refer to this style of um, cut stone, these huge rough cut uh, stones. This is still called uh, Cyclopean masonry. So, so Cyclopean, like, like made by Cyclops, masonry, which is kind of a fun origin of a, of a terminology. All right, um, by contrast, it's a big contrast to the palaces on Crete that we've looked at which were very open, right? You could just walk right up on these lovely terraces with all these like mud covered brick and all the terraces and everything's all painted red and lovely. This is a very different kind of culture that produced this because this thing is a, a fortress first and a palace second, really. It's very much built with the idea that it's going to have to be defended from enemies in battle. So very interesting contrast to think about and very defensive minded and kind of war minded culture. All right, so let's look inside these walls, the Great Walls of Turn. Um, one of the ways that they were able to build these massive structures and not have them collapse under their own weight um, was by using corbelled vaults. So remember our lion friend, the, the relieving triangle? Someone very smart notices that that is effective and is like, well, what if we expanded that triangle in space? Then we could probably make whole hallways that were more stable. And actually, we probably don't need that slab. We could just have the structure of a uh, triangle and that would defer the weight, which is pretty clever, right? I mean, we're talking about prehistoric civilizations here. So they figure out that they can do this, what's called corbelled gallery, which is basically a relieving triangle um, extended in space. And uh, this creates a new way of spanning a passageway that's 
more effective and more stable than some of the previous ones. We're not quite to the arch yet. Arch is the most stable. Figure that one out later. But we have now, in addition to the post and lentil, we also have this corbelled arch, which is like a triangle arch, okay? Um, so, Another interesting thing, so we have the Lion Gate at Mycenae and the towering fortification wall it was part of were built um, a few generations prior to the Trojan War. So they predate uh, Agamemnon and his people. Um, so they predate the when the Iliad is set. Uh, wealthy Mycenaeans of this time believed, um, or part of their, their funerary beliefs and system was that they were buried outside of the citadel. So they weren't buried within the citadel because the space in there was prioritized towards living people, right? Um, so they were built, um, they were buried in these beehive tombs like this one. These are also called tholos, T-H-O-L-O-S. That is a word that's gonna come back around when we get to Rome, so keep tholos in the back of your head a little bit. Um, this particular one is called the Treasury of Atreus because of another incident of mistaken um, attribution, okay? So when the ancient Greeks find this, uh, find this tomb, this beehive tomb, it is full of treasures. So they decided that it's a treasury or a depository for the riches of the king that predated Agamemnon, which is um, Atreus. Atreus was Agamemnon's father, so he was a king before uh, Agamemnon. So they thought that this was his treasury, where he kept all his treasure. Um, that's not correct. <laughs> it was actually someone's tomb, and they were buried with all of their earthly treasures. Um, the treasure is long gone. It was all taken, uh, stolen, and repurposed long ago. So let's look at the design. Um, if we think about that corbelled hallway, the, the relieving triangle that expands forward in space and becomes a corbelled vault, if you take that relieving triangle and spin it 360 degrees in a circle, you get a conical dome like this. So this is again based on that same principle of math and engineering that that kind of shape will defer weight outward and be structurally strong. And they're right. So we see our relieving triangle, which again they figured out just could be a, an open space, didn't have to have a, a big slab of a uh, rock carved into a triangle over the door. And then we see this conical shape of how these stones are stacked in a way that um, the weight of the soil put on top of it actually makes the thing stronger by pushing down and through to the sides as the weight is deferred. It makes it a very strong structure. So really smart, really clever engineering happening here. Okay, so as you're approaching a tholos, you come up uh, into it via a long passageway, which is called a dromos. Okay, so we've got our dromos. The walls would have been lined with stone that was covered in clay. Um, and then the door to the chamber has a relief triangle, right, above it, like the gate. The tholos is composed of a series of stones laid in a circular pattern to offset weight. Uh, this particular one is 43 feet high in the middle with no column supports of any kind, which is kind of a marvel of engineering for the time. It's pretty amazing. And we don't see something like this. This achievement in structural engineering is not surpassed until the Romans invent concrete. So this was a really big breakthrough in terms of uh, structural engineering, which is pretty cool. Uh, the treasury of Atreus, as I said, was thoroughly looted in ancient times, long before its uh, modern rediscovery by archaeologists. But archaeologists have found some pretty rad artifacts elsewhere in Mycenae. Um, the best site has been Grave Circle A. So after uh, Atreus's time, we start seeing people deciding to be buried within the walls of the citadel, but they don't want to take up lots of space. So they basically just make these shafts that go straight down in the courtyard and they put the body and then all the person's stuff and then cover it over. And this is arranged in circles. So there'll be a circle of shafts of like a family, like the real family buried, and then another circle. So grave circle A um, is one of the best sites in terms of finding things. It's you know, all of this is always a little disturbing to me because we're essentially grave robbing. But uh, Grave Circle A is uh, older than the Lion Gate. So this um, is a very, very old site. 
and it has six grave shafts for kings and their families all, all along its the circle. Uh, people were buried with gold masks, they were buried with their jewelry, with weapons, and with golden cups. Um, so our friend, the dynamite guy uh, from Germany, Schielmann, actually discovers this one. He discovers Grave Circle A. Um, so a lot of things are damaged in the initial discovery because he used dynamite to excavate with, as I told you in the introduction to this uh, module, uh, which is not great. But he does uncover this, and one of the uh, neat things he found is this gold mask um, that many scholars thought was the funerary mask of Agamemnon uh, and Schulman among them. And so this, for a long time, I think actually when I learned about it, it was still um, misnamed as the mask of Agamemnon. It wasn't his mask. It actually uh, predates him. So this is the first recorded attempt in Greece to refer to the human face in a life-sized manner, not smaller, not exaggerated. And it's done in the Reposé style, which we saw when we were looking, when we were in the Neolithic part of the early, early days module. Remember, we looked at that silver Reposé. So it's, it means it's hammered out of a single piece of metal, in this case, uh, gold. Um, a long, this was a long time practice in Egypt. We have lots of like human sized uh, works of art in Egypt that are contemporaneous with this, but this is, um, this is a, the, the earliest one we have from the Greek. Uh, mainland. This actually predates Agamemnon's reign by about 300 years. So this was not Agamemnon. Sorry, that's why I've got Agamemnon in quotes there. All right. Um, also, many fantastic bronze swords are found in Grave Circle A, uh, and they were likely made by Minoans for the Mycenaeans. Um, so the, tech, the reason that that is thought is because this is a, a Minoan technique. Uh, this is an inlaid dagger. And it has um, a, a really detailed, beautiful depiction of uh, a lion hunt. So the sword itself would have been bronze, um, and then it's inlaid with gold, silver, and nilo. So inlaid means that you kind of carve out or cast out divots in the bronze so that you can then fill it with other more precious materials for decorative purposes. So um, it's basically like you're embedding other materials into it. So this has gold and silver. And then Nilo, uh, what that is, is a black mixture. It usually involves mixing uh, sulfur with copper, silver, and lead. And it's kind of used to like fill in the area around the inlay of, of precious stones or other metals to make everything flush so everything's even on the surface. Uh, so you can see the really wonderful detailed handiwork on some of these blades. Okay. Uh, Large-scale figurative sculpture is pretty rare in this time period, or at least a lot of it did not survive if there was more of it, um, except for the Lion's Gate, which we already looked at. And then this head. So this uh, is a head. Uh, we, we know she's female because she has the white skin, which denotes her as female that we've seen um, from the frescoes where men tend to be de depicted having darker skin and women lighter skin. Um, we also don't know if this is uh, like a sphinx head that had a lion body, or if it's a goddess, or if it's a queen, or if it's just a regular person. Probably not just a regular person. They weren't usually depicted like this. Um, but the little circles of dots on her cheeks, the dot with the circles around it and the dot on her chin, that's the same kind of face painting that was um, originally on those marble statues uh, the Cycladic statues, like the Cirrus woman that we looked at in the intro and Cycladic sculpture section of this module. So you can see that much more clearly here. It's better preserved because it's it was fused in with the plaster while the plaster was wet. So that's kind of interesting because we have a similarity in this region from Hellatic mainland to uh, Cycladic sculpture in this particular kind of, of makeup of face painting, which is pretty interesting. Okay. Um, an art form that continues um, throughout this period and after the downfall of uh, Mycenae was uh, vase pottery and, and vase painting, uh, the painting of pottery. We do see a simplification in design. We don't have as much uh, background detail. Um, some of the, the styles become rather repetitive. Um, unlike the earlier Minoan examples, which each one was pretty different, we see a lot of these that are kind of copying the same motif over and over again. But this does remain 
uh, a craft that is, is honed and kept up with throughout this period. After the fall of uh, Mycenae, we have a kind of what's called a, a dark age, ages in Greece until we get into ancient Greece. So I will continue that in our next module, which is about ancient Greece. All right.